I'm excited to be here because we're continuing our, our series uh, on parables. We're just going through over the next few weeks, just very simply, what were the teachings of Jesus? We don't want to exaggerate them. We don't want to undermine them. We just want to bring forth what did Jesus actually teach? And so that way we can hang on to the truths that come from the parables and we can, anything that Jesus didn't actually say, maybe we should actually move on from it. And so we want to look at a parable. Uh, Today I want to look at a parable in Matthew chapter 18 called the parable of the unmerciful servant. Uh, But one, quickly, when I uh, do fuel with the students, the middle school and high schoolers or various adults, one of the questions I get quite often is they go, Caleb, what actually do you do for your job? Because people come to church and they go, okay, I see you on Sunday, I see you on Sunday night with the students, but what actually do you do during the week? And I'm offended. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I go, no, it's, it's pretty easy. Actually, uh, the whole job is to be with people, to help pastor people. And so probably the thing that Pastor Fred and I do more than any is just meet with, with various people. And the reason why I bring this up is this parable that I'm about to teach on is one of the parables, if we were meeting on a regular basis, more times than not, this parable is one of the first ones that come up, comes up. When we do our rejuvenation project with people that are feeling burnt out on ministry, wanting to be back in the game of ministry, this is one of the parables that we go through almost immediately. Because the power of this parable that I'm about to teach on it, it is so powerful. It has the power to free you from wherever you're at. I'm serious. It doesn't matter if you're the oldest person in the room. It doesn't matter if you're the youngest person in the room. The, the parable that Jesus tells here is one to give you freedom. And so I want to be able to, to teach it in a way that exactly presents it the way Jesus did because I don't want you to walk out of here with the, the burdens that you have. I want you to walk out of here going, there is hope, there is life, and I can walk in the freedom that Jesus has for me. So I'm going to read it, and we'll, we'll see what, um, what God has for us. So Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. You can look on the screen, or if you follow along in your Bibles. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told the master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So the parables... Wow. The parables are used stories. They're not real stories. They're stories that Jesus tells to convey a point. And there's one point in specific. And so what are we talking about today? Well, Peter comes to Jesus. The context is Peter says, hey, hey Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister? Seven times? Like a lot? And Jesus turns back, not seven times, but 77 times. To be completely frank with you, I don't even know what the heck that means, except there's no limit to how many times you should forgive your brother or sister. I wasn't around during those times to know what that exact, that phrase meant, but I do know that it means, from the scholars, there's no limit. There's no limit to the amount of times that you should forgive. And so to emphasize this point, he tells this parable. 
Now, if you're, if you're like me, forgiveness, you've probably heard it. If, if this is your first time in church, then maybe it's your first time hearing it. But more than likely, even if you're not a Christian, you have heard of forgiveness. Christian or unchristian, your parents probably at one point saw something wrong in you and a child. Maybe you hit your sister. I've never done that. Uh, maybe I hit my sister. <laughs> And my parents go, hey, say you're sorry. I'm sorry. All right, sister, tell them you forgive them. I forgive you. Right? Has anybody else been there? Like, we've always had, this is what we think about forgiveness. It's kind of this unreluctant heart on both ends. And we call something that we know is not good and we say it's good, it's done, it's finished. Forgive and forget. Amen? Right? Except none of us feel better. And so we go to these camps, we go to churches, and we hear these pastors, and they go, hey, if anybody sinned in here, in fact, Pastor Fred said this last week, is there any sinners in here? It's 100%, and I'm telling you, it's 100% this week as well. And so there's 100% sinners in here, and is there anybody that needs a Savior? And everyone goes, yes. And so we all feel crappy in our hearts, and we go, you know what? I guess there is hope. I have, the gospel is supposed to save me from my sins. And so Jesus you know, please forgive me for my sins. I feel awful. I feel terrible. Please forgive me. That's true. Amen? Amen. Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, for your sins. The problem is most of us stop there when Jesus had a, a larger equation to give us. He's not under, he, he, in no way am I undermining the cross. I just want to present to you The whole equation that Jesus is telling us. That you have to be forgiven. But you don't stop there and go, I prayed the prayer, so now all my problems are gone. Because I meet with a lot of people that are born again Christians and you're miserable. And you keep going, well, this doesn't make sense. All I've been told is just pray the prayer, Jesus, please forgive me. And they say everything's going to be good. And then I'm going to feel better and and I'm going to be better. Except it's been 25 years and I'm still no different. That's real. I'll just say that's what's in your heart. You don't have to raise your hand and say anything, but I know that's what's in your heart. Because I meet with you. And I talk to you. And I am you. That's how I feel. Hey, Jesus, I prayed this. Why is it? How come I'm no better? And can I just stay? It's because we've only looked at part of the equation. This parable is the next part of the equation. So what what is happening? Here's the story. There's a king and a servant and some other servants. The king is God. He's rich and kind. Amen? Amen. And then you and I are the main servant in the story. If you don't know who you are, I'm telling you, it's you. If you think it's not you, you're mistaken. The servant is you in the story. You have to understand. And so what is happening? A servant is called in because he owes a great amount of debt. How much debt exactly does this guy owe? Well, the scripture says 10,000 bags of gold. Or in other translations, it's 10,000 talents of gold. Uh, If you look down and probably in your Bible, there's a, a little note that says a talent is worth about 20 years of a day laborer's wages. So one talent is 20 years of a day laborer's wages. This guy owes 10,000. So he owes 200,000 years of day laborer's wages. Probably on lottery tickets, right? And he, like, how did, he get in, how did he get into this mess? We don't know exactly how he got into the mess. We just know that he owes 200,000 years of day laborer's wages. And then all of a sudden, the person who uh, loaned it to him, which the king is very rich just to have this much money. And so he, he loans it out. And all of a sudden, hey, it's payday. Pay up. Most of us couldn't pay like a a couple thousand dollar bill, let alone 200,000 years of your wages (laughs) in one day. And so this guy is is not in a good place. And so the king looks at him and says, well, if you can't pay that debt, uh, I'm going to have to sell you and your children and and your wife to pay up for the debt. And maybe that will cover it. So he's, 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 he's done. His life, as he knows it, is completely done. Can you see the parallels to this? You and I, as sinners, Paul says, for the wages of sin is death. If we all understand that we've done something wrong, we were born sinners, you know what we owe? 
a debt that can only be paid with your life. There's no other way. You can try to do your good deeds. You can try to donate some volunteer hours here and there. But I'm telling you, the only way you pay the debt that you owe is with your life. And this is the predicament that the servant, you and I, is in. And so what does he do? Well, he has no other choice. He falls on his knees and he begs, please have mercy on me. It just please don't take my family. Please don't take my kids. And what does the king do? He has pity on him. Says, I can't see your debt. Go on your way. Yes! 200,000 years of my life. If I, if I started working when Jesus told this parable, and then up to today, 2022, I'd have finished off 1% of the debt. If I started working when Jesus actually told the parable. You have no idea how big this debt is. And you, the, the debt that you have in your life for somebody to just look at that and go, it's good. No worries. I'm filthy rich. <laughs> I don't, I got more, I got more than you can ever have. And so you know what? It's canceled. You're good. Take a deep breath. Does that feel good? And I think a lot of us have felt that in our lives. You, you give your life to Jesus and you go, oh my goodness. I can breathe again. 200,000 years of day laborer's wages is off of my life. And so he walks out and he finds one of his fellow friends, his servant. And you know what? This is what I would think would happen. Hey, dude, you wouldn't just believe I was in there with the king. And uh, I owe a lot of money. Don't ask how. Please don't ask how because it's embarrassing. But all I'll say, he canceled all 200,000 years of my debt. And my family and my kids were free. We're free. We can live again. But what does the story say? What is the parable? What is Jesus trying to say? As soon as he walks out, he finds his friend who owes him a hundred silver coins or a hundred denarii, which is the equivalent of a hundred days of day labor wages. That's a very payable debt. Your 200,000 years is not very payable. You can pay a hundred days of wages. And so he comes and he, and he doesn't just go, hey, um, pay back. He chokes the guy. He grabs him around the neck and says, pay back what you owe. And what does the, he falls on his face, his friend, and says the exact same thing. Be patient with me, I will pay it back. The phrase that this, this servant had just said to the king just hours before, it's now role reversal. Another servant is on his knees before this guy and uses the exact same phrasing that was just used to free him of his billions of dollars in debt. And if you're hearing the story as Jesus tells it for the first time, you would think the guy would go, oh, it dawned on me. I was just forgiven, so I should forgive this guy. And the twist in the story is that he refused. He refused to forgive him. And instead, he threw him in jail. Now, this is ironic. This guy is thrown into jail until he can pay back everything he owed. How much income is this guy generating in jail? And you know why this is, this is painfully ironic is because how much are we doing that to the people in our lives? I know every single person in here has been hurt in some way. We don't have to compare the hurts, but I just know that every person has been hurt. And this is what we do. You should, they should apologize. They should feel sorry for what they've done. And you know what we do? We throw them in the proverbial jail, throw them the cold shoulder, and say, I'm not going to talk to them until they learn how to apologize. And it's the same as if you threw somebody in jail until they pay you back. You took away the very possibility of them even being able to. And now there's no hope to be even paid back what it, what it costs them. And we do this all the time. All the time in our relationships. As we just turn our back on people and go, they'll figure it out. When the only person that it costs is yourself. And it doesn't just cost you that 100 days. 
it actually costs you more because the friends, the other servants, look around and go, uh, this doesn't make sense. You literally just got free of 200,000 years and you're just going to throw this guy in jail for 100 days? I mean, he lawfully can, but they go and tell the, the king. And they tell the king, this is what happened. And so, get summoned in. And this is where we should all pay very close attention. The master called the servant in. You wicked servant. Who's the king? Who's the master? It's God. Who are you? The servant. Imagine. Everyone wants to hear the phrase, well done, good and faithful servant. But the possibility of hearing, you wicked servant, is just as likely, unless we pay attention to this parable. You wicked servant. He said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. And here's the point of this parable. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Whose sin put him on the cross? It was my sin. What does God expect? Shouldn't you just have mercy as I have just had on you? Shouldn't you go and have mercy? In his anger, this is the scary part to me. In the anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is how he will treat you. This is not hypothetical anymore. The parable is hypothetical until we get to verse 35. And then it's very literal. This is how your heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. We have forgiveness. The guy gets forgiven a great debt. He has the option to go and forgive somebody else. He chooses not to. And then what happens? He now re-owes everything that he had. And so we've been taught, hey, just pray the prayer, you're good. And if you're miserable, maybe we should take a second look at a heart and go, uh, according to Jesus' teachings, according to Jesus' parables, the only thing that's going to cost you your forgiveness is if you don't go and repay the favor. And the, the, the thing is, it's not just a one-time instance. Matthew 7, 1 through 2, Jesus again is saying, Do not be judged, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Whatever your measuring stick is, is the measuring stick that's going to be used on you. The level of expectation you have on other people is the level of expectation that's going to get used for you. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But which means it's not just done at this moment, but if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Is anybody hearing something a little bit different than this, hey, I'm good. These are Jesus' words, the Jesus Christ that we're following, that we're professing in. And you know what the thing that can get in the way of your own forgiveness is the way that you forgive other people. It's not that Jesus can't forgive everything. He will and he can. There's just one roadblock. And it's you. And it's me. And so if we show up to Jesus and say, hey, you know, I, I, I need a savior. And he goes, great, I, I saved you from everything. But Caleb, you didn't return the favor to anybody. Those other people that I love just as much as you, you held them hostage. If you were forgiven so great a debt, why didn't you just return the favor? And I know every single person in here has forgiveness, needs to forgive somebody. The only people that don't are the ones that have already done it. This is, not, this, is, this is everyone's problem. And you know what I find is the greatest problem? It's not your pain. Because what we normally do is we look to the right, look to the left, and we go, okay, well, my pain's not as much as theirs. Or, oh, I was hurt way more than this person was hurt, and so I should have a, a bigger problem. And so most of us are holding on to our pain, what's been happening to us, or what has happened to us, or what we've done, and we compare it to somebody else's, 
when the whole time that's, that's irrelevant. Pain's pain. And it's okay to have pain in your life. Every person has pain in their life. Every person needs a savior. Why do you need a savior? Because we're in pain and we're lost. So it's okay to acknowledge that there, there's pain in the, in the world. But instead of comparing your pain to someone else's pain and talking about it over coffee and going, well, we're all just painful, painfully in pain, you know where the problem is? If the problem is not in your pain. The problem is in your memory. It's in my memory. Somewhere between this guy getting 200,000 years forgiven on a cross and then walking as soon as he walked out, he goes, ah! No, this, this, this little memory, it wasn't like 10 years later he found a person. It was the same day. Some translations say, as no sooner had he left. And so you know one of the, the best ways to walk in forgiveness is never forget the debt you owed. If you walk into this room, and especially at this time of year, we're going through the Easter season. If you walk into this room and you don't look at this cross and you go, oh Lord, I was the worst. I was the worst. Thank you. You can look at the person that caused you pain. You can look at the person that has hurt you. And you can look at them and have a better time forgiving them when you have a better memory of the depth you were, you were, the, you were dead. You had no chance. Matthew 10, 8, when Jesus says, um, he sent the people off to go do ministry, he says, freely you have received, freely give. At some point we go, we get this entitlement where we go like, I deserve God's forgiveness, but so-and-so, they don't deserve mine. Man, you got a free gift. I got a free gift. And so the only logical thing, the only thing that God is requiring us to be more like him, to know more of who he is like, is to go and do likewise. I think I made my point. If you have someone in your life that you need to forgive, it's not just a matter of feeling better about yourself. It's literally life or death. You could be losing the very forgiveness that you are claiming to have. Can I say that as kindly and sternly as I can? Maybe if you have problems with people, we shouldn't be so confident that we're going to run up to God and say, hey, I'm here. Did you miss me? And he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You want to ensure that he's not saying, how wicked. I, the things I did for you, why couldn't you just go and do it for other people? Here's some ways you know if you need some forgiveness, to offer forgiveness to somebody in your life. One, if you're just bitter. It's not about anything specific, but you're just naturally bitter. If you're naturally anxious, you're naturally fearful. Those are generic. They can be of other things. But what I've noticed is those bitterness, anxiousness, and fear are usually not too far away from this forgiveness issue. What you think in your head, you could go, oh, this has nothing to do with my dad when I was five years old. But if we were going to sit down or you were going to sit down with a counselor, this is why we always joke, it's, it's, oh, it's my dad. Well, seriously. Because these unforgiveness issues, if you hold on to them, produce bitterness, fear, anxiousness, all of these things that you're dealing with and medicating with, and that's a possibility that you do need that. But a lot of times, maybe we need to look at our forgiveness and look at our heart. It's a major piece. With somebody specifically, here's how you know if, if you may be bitter with them, more specific. If I said somebody's name right now, up on stage and I began to praise them before you all today. Think of the person that you are just not good with right now. And I began to talk super good about them. They're the best person in the world. They have done so much for this world. They are the ch changers of everything. And I begin to speak good about them. And you're just going, uh, Caleb, do you know what they've done? Do you know who they are? You're and you just go on and on and you begin to cringe. So if I begin to praise them up from stage, would you cringe? There's probably some unforgiveness in your heart. 
If you saw them in Kroger and they didn't see you, you saw them first, you would avoid them. You see them looking at some grocery item and you go, oh, I got to get out of here. You don't want to talk to them. You may have some forgiveness. If you're having a great day, you're celebrating something, you think about them at a random time of the day, and then it just changes your mood. You're having a great day, everything's going well, and then somehow some thought popped in your head, and then you just think about how shameful you are or how shameful they are, and it ruins your mood. Forgiveness. If you think about that person, then you begin to make excuses about why what you did wasn't wrong or what was done to you wasn't that bad. There's probably still some unforgiveness issues. And more than likely, one of those things has pricked your heart. And you go, "Uh uh-oh, it's me. Yeah, that's why why we're preaching this. Because I know it is. And Jesus knows it is. But we can be free. And so if you think, why isn't this prayer just praying, Jesus, forgive me, working? It's because that's part of the equation. The other part is that we need to do the same. And that's where the freedom comes in. So can I teach you in just a couple minutes how to do that? Number one, if you're going to take notes, this is when I would take notes. Because you want to, just these few steps. If you can walk through these steps, you're going to get freedom. I've seen it in people. I've seen it in myself. Step number one, you have to repent yourself. So the the progression goes, the servant's forgiven. Servant doesn't forgive, therefore it's kind of revoked. You cannot begin to forgive someone else when you first haven't freely received. And so you have to freely receive before you can freely give. Does this make sense? And so if you need to repent, there's kind of two reasons to repent. One, if you've never said, Jesus, have mercy on me. I'm telling you, the wages of sin is death. And if you've never looked to the cross and you've never said, Jesus, please have mercy on me, the death is on you right now. And the good news is it doesn't take anything for you to do. It just takes for you to go, Jesus, save me. Please help me. And so you receive it and repent. But most likely, some of us in the room have prayed that prayer, but we're holding other people hostage. And I would then say, go ahead and repent again for not forgiving the way you were forgiven. So the step number one is repent. Step number two is ask the Holy Spirit for help because the Holy Spirit was given to us to, remember, to remind us of what Jesus has taught and to help us. And so what I would do, this is, this is exactly what I would do. I would, take, I would allocate about an hour and I would go sit somewhere where no one is because if you're going to uncover some of the deep things in your life, you're going you're gonna to need some space. And so I would get a piece of paper, a notebook, something on my phone to be able to write. But first I would sit and I would do this. I'd say, Holy Spirit, I know that I need to forgive. I don't really know how and I don't really feel like it. But would you please help me to forgive? And I'd just pray that prayer. And then I'd say, Holy Spirit, remind me of the people that I need to forgive. Because more than likely, if someone's hurt you, you put it in deep down, and sometimes that has to come back out. It feels better to have it closed off, oh, I forgot about it. But you'd, it's still there. And so you say, Holy Spirit, remind me. And then what I would do is I'd begin to write down every single thought that comes, person, uh, an interaction of something that's happened. Now, you might have a list of 15, 20, 45, 75, 100. I don't care. It doesn't make you better or worse to have more or less. So if you think, uh, more than 15 is kind of a shame. And, I, and so you stop. I need you to put down every person that comes to mind in this designated time. Got it? This is very, very important. Because if you have a little bit of unforgiveness, you're, it still costs you. We need to be free. So write it down. Then I use these cards with students and, and, and people that I meet with, and they're in the back if you want to grab some after this. Um, but you take one person's name from that list, and you write it down on a card or on a piece of paper. And you say, I forgive, write their name in, for, and then you have to be specific. You have to write down everything that they've done. Usually the closer the person is to you, the longer the list. So if you have a spouse, a family member, mom or dad, that list is going to be long. You should also probably put yourself on the list. 
It's usually a big holdup for people. And so you may even have to put yourself on this list and write out what you need to forgive yourself for. And the key is that you write it all out. And then you say out loud, this is why I suggest you do it alone, I forgive, and you begin to say it. Now the things you ri write on here are not just the, thing, the moments that happened. It's also the ongoing pain that's caused. Let's imagine I get hit by a drunk driver. Okay, this is completely hypothetical. I get hit by a drunk driver. Well, I have to forgive the drunk driver for being irresponsible and putting my life in danger. And so I may have to forgive the specific instance that happened, but now I'm also paralyzed. And every day I have to live with it. And so some of us have, a, okay, I can forgive that moment, or they feel like I can't forgive it because I have to deal with it every day. The process is the same for both. The key is that you just acknowledge both. You acknowledge the initial pain that was caused, and you acknowledge the ongoing thing that was stolen from you that you're going to have to live with for the rest of your life. But don't have a short memory when it comes to those types of things. Remember the cross. And then the key after that is after you say, I forgive them, you will not feel any different. The reason why I suggest that you say it out loud is because forgiveness is not a feeling, it's a choice. It's an absolute choice of the will. If you are waiting to feel better, you're going to be waiting all your life. But if you can choose to walk into forgiveness the same way you choose to love someone, then you will begin to find the freedom. And here's how you begin to choose it. You say it out loud, and then you turn the, the card over, and you begin to write a prayer of blessing on the card for that person. And you don't pray that they would be fixed. You pray that they would be blessed. And in my life specifically, the person that I had to forgive the most was my dad. I remember when I was in high school, we just never saw eye to eye on anything. And it was just like progressing worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And finally, it was to the point where we had to go get some outside help, some counseling. And here's what the counselor said. We sit down. He goes, I really don't care about your problems. <laughs> He's a good counselor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really care about your problems because your problems don't matter. He wasn't trying to be insensitive, but we could sit here day after day and talk about your problems. The solution is not in your problems. The solution is outside of your problems. And so he says, we can, we can talk about the problems, but it's not going to do any good. Here's what I need you to do. I need you guys to remember why you love each other. And so for three weeks, I need you to write a letter to each other every day. Something you admire about them, something you love about them, something you're thankful for about them. It's all kind of this blessing stuff. And at first it was a little difficult, but here's what happened. Each day my heart got a little softer. Each day I warmed up a little bit more, and each day his heart warmed up towards me. And after three weeks of just saying what I loved about my dad, he was no longer the problem. And this is what happens. I'm not saying you have to be friends with the person that you're forgiving, but if you can think blessing about them, the only person that it, it changes your heart. It changes your heart towards them. And guess what that's called? Freedom. Why do you think my dad and I had such problems? It's probably because we had a calling that's so similar to each other that we needed each other. And how was, how was the, the enemy going to get in the way? Well, maybe I'll just make them hate each other. And so he just gets in the way. And it wasn't very hard. But when I began to choose into thinking positively about my dad, and it wasn't even all of this process. This has come after that. But it saved it. And now I, I love my dad, and I've learned so much from him that I would have lost if I would have just kept putting him in jail for 100 days of wages. And I'm telling you, it's the same for every person. I understand your pain. I understand that it's hard. But there's freedom for every single person here in this room. And I would really encourage you, grab some of these cards and do it. Do it. It's freed up so many people. Can I have you stand up? We're just going to close. Lois. I think well, I'm just going to close it up. Uh, I want you to close your eyes. And something about this message hit home for you. You can feel it. And so we're just going to pray for that, and I pray that you walk in forgiveness. So Lord, I pray for each person here in this room. 
I pray that the words that hit home for them, I pray that they would respond to it. I pray that they would not, uh, that they would not walk out of here and go, ah, good message. I pray that this message would wreck people because it's, it's the key to being forgiven. And, I, and Lord, your deepest desire is to give everyone forgiveness. And I pray that we'd be able to receive the full measure of your forgiveness, not our half measure. And so, Lord, I pray for courage for each person to look back at the pain in their life. I pray that, that they would have the courage to sit down and look at these dark thoughts and know that, it, that their forgiveness is not dependent on somebody else coming and apologizing, but it's them turning to you and freely giving what they have received. Lord, thank you for the cross. I pray that I never forget that I was the one that put you there. I pray that it'd be on the forefront of my mind. And I pray that it'd be on the forefront of this mind, uh, the mind of this church. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So grab some cards out there, and here's, my, here's the benediction today. Go and be the church. Freely you have received. Freely give. Freely give. In Jesus' name, amen.